What is happening isn't a random accident or a scourge, and it's nothing new either. It has happened before, and it will happen again. A sombre warning from writer and scientist Paolo Giordano. How Contagion Works was published at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis and became a word-of-mouth hit, with proceeds from its Italian edition going towards academic research into epidemiology. Paolo Giordano, thank you so much for joining us from your own confinement there, I see. Uh, how's that going for you? It's, it's going well, uh, but it's starting to be a little long and challenging after more than a month. Your book, How Contagion Works, was written and published as the world finds itself in the middle of this pandemic. And in terms of the timescale, you wrote it very, very quickly, in less than a week, at the very beginning of March. Now, that was only the beginning of the epidemic here in Europe. We didn't really know uh, what was going on, how it would develop. Why did you choose that moment to put pen to paper? Well, um, we had just found the... I would say the first cluster of contagion in the north of Italy. So that was February 21st. And I started the book exactly one week later. So it was the last week of, let's say, freedom before the lockdown started in our country. Um, and I wrote it in exactly five days for many reasons. The first one was a very practical constraint because it was very clear that with the lockdown, also publishers would have been in trouble uh, publishing new books. And that's what actually happened. So I had a real deadline on the Friday of, the, of that week. But the reason why I cho chose to do it in the first place was that there was a lot of confusion around. Uh, it was clear that the situation was rather bad, but people and even politicians were, and even experts, I have to say, were still divided between those who were saying, okay, we have to take action and be quick, and other people and other politicians who were saying, oh, no, this is just a seasonal flu, uh, it's all this uh, fuss, is crazy. And I realized simply by looking at the curves in China and what was going on there, and how we start and how it got started in Italy, that we were wasting time, and all those delays would eventually cost uh, not only lives but a lot of sufferings. Originally, when we got the manuscript, it was I think it was on March 10. It was six or seven days before France got shut down, and we originally meant to publish this book very quickly indeed, but in a regular way and to, and to publish it and print it and have it out in the bookstores. And then by the time things got started, um, everything got shut down and we were not able, we realized we were not able to put it out in bookstores. So we had to change everything around and decided to publish it online for free. Now, I believe you also wrote an article for the Italian press at the end of February, which stressed the mathematical nature of contagion, how something can spread exponentially. And you use imagery like marbles hitting one another or water gushing from a pipe. Why was it important for you to use that sort of metaphor and language? Well, um, you explain mathematics more easily to a wide audience if you make it a little more practical, uh, visual. So uh, I was looking for metaphors that could be easily understood. Uh, mathematics is very important, especially what we're seeing it uh, every day more, but especially in the first phase of an epidemic, you mostly understand what is going on through maths. Even before uh, it becomes a health problem, an epidemic is a mathematical problem in a way. So uh, I thought that giving just a couple of concepts of, of the mathematical structure of the pandemic, of the epidemic could be useful for people to better understand 
uh, what was being asked from them and why. Speaking of maths and science, there is a feeling that uh, epidemiologists are the people everyone wants to hear from right now. Uh, after a political period in some countries where experts or scientists were pushed to one side, do you see this as a proof of a renewed confidence in science, in verifiable theories? Is science back in fashion, so to speak? I really do hope so, I, we, but it doesn't mean that I believe so, uh, honestly, because uh, man, we're making a lot of promises during this crisis. Uh, and one of them is that we're gonna listen a little more uh, expert to experts and uh, people who have a knowledge and even scientists. Uh, we were really on the wrong track about this because politics had become something that was only and all the time looking for only sharp comments, quick answers, uh, simplicity where there, where there was no space for, for simplicity. And now we're, uh, we're listening to the scientists and they, they have this, amazing attitude of being able to say, we don't know this, we need more time, we need to prove the theory, we need to discuss, we need to wait. That is something we were absolutely not used to anymore, just answers and tweets and posts very. So I really do hope it, it's gonna last longer than the emergency, but it will really depend on us now, you yourself come from a scientific background, you're a doctor of physics, but you also went into literature with the hugely successful novel, uh, The Solitude of Prime Numbers, and you write fiction as well. How do you reconcile those two different perspectives on the world, one that resides in fact and the other in make-believe or fiction? If you write fiction, you know that most of the efforts that you do are uh, in the direction of being truthful. You're writing fictionalized, fictional stories, but you want to get as close to the truth as you can through that fiction. I normally do a lot of study in the background of my novels. There's always study, uh, there's always theory, there's always science. So um, I've never seen a real discrepancy between the, the two attitudes. Fiction is not simply about fantasy it's really about the world and describing how the world looks and i even think that you can tell the truth better through fiction sometimes than by simply uh, describing it directly and specifically, some people are talking about the world's response to the coronavirus pandemic as a sort of dress rehearsal for the climate crisis that's headed towards us. Do you think this is going to mean that countries, governments, people start addressing the strain on our ecosystem and taking significant steps for change? Again, I really do hope so, but I don't know if I believe so. Um, Climate change is even more complicated than this pandemic. Um, it's less scary only because it's, it's much slower in its evolution. And, um, and it's very hard to figure out all the different consequences that climate change has. It, it really takes an, an abstract thinking to uh, to face climate change and that's the reason why we were so slow in acting about it so i think what is happening is in a weird way a chance of seeing how important and urgent our it, it is to to fix some of our relationships with nature because there are uh, connections between the possible future pandemics and um, things we do to the environment. We, we, there are studies of how climate change could uh, 
um, could amplify the spread of some diseases like malaria, like dengue. And so it's not unrelated. And this is a moment of, I mean, seeing the effects and maybe be able to uh, react. Right now, people have perhaps a little bit more free time to be reading than usual. And beyond your book, do you have any uh, advice? What sort of books should we be turning to during this period of confinement? Well, um, I think a, a book that actually, I can't say that it saved my life, but somehow it made me aware of this before because I read it a few years ago when this was not definitely not on the horizon is a book by David Quammen uh, and the book is called Spillover and it's a book about epidemics and pandemics and there's pretty much everything in there that one needs to know today and I'm having a hard time reading fiction I have to say I'm like I'm a little stuck with reality and cannot take my eyes off reality. Uh, but I'm reading uh, Svetlana Alexievich, maybe because she was, she was a witness. She's a witness. She's been a witness of many uh, big transformations in her country. And so it gives me hope to see how yeah, how people went through it and things change and we're still there. Hello, Giordano. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. The world is ever changing. The news doesn't wait. That's why at France 24, we'll always be there to help make sense of world events. For the best international coverage, 24 hours a day, no matter what, France 24 is with you everywhere, all the time. Liberté, égalité, actualité.